everybody. And everybody says silently because they're all on mute. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. So we have September 13th. And today's hot topic, clauses. So guys, jump in at any time. Uh, ask questions if you have them. Let us know what uh, you've got uh, that you may be curious about. Uh, but there's a number of clauses that actually exist out there. Now, uh, I'm going to pull up here, uh, and we're just going to go through these, but it's a Word document. What I want you to know, and, and Emily, I'll have you, if you don't mind, watch the uh, waiting room there. Um, I'm going to share. What do, 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 do. Let me get that to happen here. I'm just going to share the Word document. What I want you to know is all these clauses that I'm sharing with you now, these clauses are actually in the MLS, the Real Comp MLS. To my knowledge, they're in any MLS that we're a part of. So whatever you use for signing in Real Comp, we use the uh, Remind Docs Plus. So whatever you use, you should find these clauses in there. I haven't looked, uh, but occasionally these things disappear on me. So I'll be taking a look at both of these for our gold team and our blue team, making sure that all of these are in here. Um, what I want you to know is be cautious and wary of writing your own clauses. You're seeing it, Bob? Why are you not seeing it? Are you, hey, are you guys seeing this um, that I'm sharing? Are you seeing clauses created for MLS? Yeah, it's on there. Because it says I'm sharing, and I see it on mine here. So I'm going to assume that everybody's got it. Otherwise, they'd be talking back to me. Interesting. All right. Um, so be wary of any of the thing. Any time that you're going to go on to paragraph 27, additional conditions on a purchase agreement, and you're going to start typing something out, be cautious. Because too often we don't have a complete enough phrase or clause that we enter into it, which is going to leave us open to issues, okay? Um, let me give you a simple one, and this actually has recent, uh, recently happened here within the Rochester office. Um, here's a clause. Appliances Existing appliances on premises to be uh, left with the property. Okay. Sound like a decent clause? Um, I, I see a couple faces here going, hmm. Guys, don't ever write it generality when it can be written specific. So appliances, one of the things that I want to put in that clause, and we have a paragraph where it's all the personal property, but on that clause, start the clause with existing, E-X-I-S-T-I-N-G. Start with existing, and then spell it out. Stove, refrigerator, washer, dryer, microwave, spell it out. Because if you go into a court of law and it says all appliances on premises, Somebody tell me what's left. We don't know, right? I, I mean, a judge is going to sit there and go, so what was there? Well, the only thing that was there was, great. And then what does the seller say? Oh, no, those weren't there. And by the way, all the appliances on the premises, when? See, even if you put at time of showing, guys, don't do it. The time that you're saving yourself by not writing out the specific appliances will cost you in the end because you'll end up in a court of law, and I don't want to see any of us there. But that's a quick example of what we think is 
I wish I could have turned the camera quick enough because I'm sitting here watching and there's two birds on people's shoulders that just walked by. <laughs> Sorry, it was a major distraction. Well, we, we, yeah, we all enjoy it here, but that was a squirrel. In that case, it was a couple of birds. Anyway, be thorough in regards to your clauses. So that's the reason we're talking about this. So what you see on the screen, let me give you this first one. Um, I, I put it on here and you've been looking at it. You're going, why would I even need this? Because you want to make sure that you're going to get paid a straight commission of 3% from the buyer, or at least have the opportunity to be able to collect that. Um, oh, you guys can't see it, can you? Hold on for just a second, guys. I got some. It's the best I'm going to do for right now. Yeah. Um, so what you have here, guys, is simply, I want to make sure I get paid. So this would be, if you were to use the Michigan Association of Realtors, buyer long form. So that's what the MAR long form is standing for. I just want you to know that right now, that is it. But the other reason that you might use this is what you're seeing with what I have here is it says, I'll get 3% of the purchase price, but if I find you a for sale by owner, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I'm going to get 4%. Uh, she said, Mr. And you're going, why would you do that? We only get 3% because I'm teaching you how to make more money. So ask for 4%, the buyer's the one who's going to be responsible for paying you. Where are you going to get it from? Well, you're going to build it into the transaction. How do you build it into the transaction? Well, the buyer's going to say, Mr. Mr. Seller, you are to pay my buyer's broker's fee of 4%. You get to represent only the buyer, not the seller, and everybody's going to be happy because every party got what they wanted. Now, here's the other. If I'm really representing my buyer correctly, and especially with the market that we've been in, that we're still somewhat in, although it's shifted, one of the things that you should be doing is going out and looking for properties that aren't even on the market. Now, how much do you get paid to find a property that's not on the market? If you use this, 5%. So we're going to ask for 5%. I'm going to go out and find a home that isn't on the market, I want to represent the buyer only because that's the reason I'm out there. Good thing we talked agency prior to this, although people are still going, how is all that going to work? Represent only the buyer. 1% is now saved in that transaction, and you get to represent the buyer only. There's a huge advantage to them being able to do that. So I'm telling you, I, I've just introduced something to you way out of the weirdness that you're going, but that's not normal. Well, you can do what everybody else is doing and make what everybody else is making, or you can do what nobody else is doing and make even more. So that is what that clause is for. Uh, if you need more, you think that you've got the guts to go ahead and ask for it, let us know. We have a question in the chat. There is a question in the chat. What, what happens if dryer breaks before we close? Wow. That, uh, you know, not as part of the clauses, but that's a great one. And actually, if you go back, I believe in one of the Phil Seaver Hot Topic Tuesdays, Phil addressed that. And oddly enough, if I remember correctly, so don't hold me to this question, guys, but we're addressing the aspect of what if the dryer breaks during the time of occupancy? So you gave him 30 days post-closing occupancy. If I remember correctly, Phil said, that's on the seller. It's on the seller. Yeah, but what if it was working? So it, it, in the office here, it was, well, it would say on the disclosure, if it's working or if it's not working. And it has to be sold in that same condition. So, yeah, I, I think that is the reasoning for it. Um, but uh, yeah, basically I think it's still going to be on the buyer at that, or excuse me, on the seller to replace or repair 
that broken down dryer. So good one. If any more come up, Bob, let me know. Appreciate it. Uh, buyer agency compensation, the shortfall. So let's say I've got a hardcore buyer representation agreement. I get 3%. And then it comes out that, not that this is happening, it is, but the buyer, or excuse me, the listing broker is only offering 2.5%. Now what do we do? Oh. Well, if you use the verbiage properly, you would simply do this. Seller to contribute, in this case, 0.5% of the purchase price to be applied toward the buyer's broker's fee. Now, you can't do that, but who can? The buyer. It's the buyer's purchase agreement. The buyer can put that in there. <coughs> Be careful. Don't write something different than this. Otherwise, we could have a problem. <coughs> It'll clear up. <laughs> um, we could have a problem with the code of ethics. Right? Because Code of Ethics says that we're not going to uh, try to negotiate the fee that the seller's done or uh, try to negotiate the amount of compensation. Well, we're not. The buyer has got to make that up should you choose to pursue it. Additional conditions, you know, right now on the listing ticket, it shows two and a half percent. Yes, could you put it on there? You know, seller to pay three percent right on the initial offer, so they already know. Well, this would be, yeah. So, the question I'm going to summarize, I think it'll make sense to you guys. We can't change on the buyer side, so when we're talking about representing the buyer, we can't. we the agent, the broker cannot negotiate what the selling or I, let me rephrase that, the listing broker has offered as compensation. That would be against the code of ethics. So this is the aspect that they offered two and a half. They offered two. We've got a buyer representation contract says we get three. And if we want, because we've written that contract correctly, to pursue the other half or 1%, it's gonna come from the buyer. Okay, so everybody understand that that's gonna come from the buyer. It's not gonna come from the listing broker. I cannot change that by code of ethics. You got it. So that's where the buyer can pull it out of their pocket or the buyer could say, seller, I need you to pay that difference, half percent, one percent, whatever it is. The buyer asks the seller to make up the difference, not the listing broker. Right there. So what what you you can see seller to contribute blank percent of the purchase price to be applied toward buyer's broker's fee. It's the way it's written is the big key on this. We're not, we're, we agent broker not asking. It's the buyer in their purchase agreement asking the seller. Not us asking the listing broker, not the buyer asking the listing broker. It's the buyer in their purchase agreement to the seller. We want you to make up this difference that your broker decided not to pay. Okay. And, and you're okay with that. Now, by the way, I would tell you that you could expect some grief from some agents because they don't understand what we've written, okay? And if they go, well, you can't do that. That's against code of ethics. Look, I didn't do it. That's my buyer in their purchase agreement asking the seller to do it. This has nothing to do with your offer of compensation. We're taking it, okay? Bob? Are we using these sentences, if we're using the C21 forms? You could, you could, but specifically these first two, if you're using the MAR, 
if you're using the mar and it's got those clauses in as I have them. So guys, if, if this really is something that makes sense to you, please provide me the feedback. Tell me that you'd like to get more, but I don't wanna to spend too much time on those two and one primary reason. Most of us aren't going to pursue that. We're not gonna ask for the difference and that's okay. I just want it if you want and you've got the guts and you feel that you really do earn your commission that you can ask for that shortfall, okay? Let's move to the land division transfers. So this is just one that's specifically regarding vacant land with the potential transfers. Um, a purchase agreement may not specifically cover it. And so if you need to make a counter offer or you need to have full and complete clarification, that's the reason that this particular clause is put in. And it says simply this, regarding unplanted land, seller represents the property is not a new division under the Land Division Act, and seller owns no other contiguous unplanted land unless otherwise disclosed in writing. Seller is transferring to buyer all available divisions. See, if it's not addressed, they may be splitting off from a parent parcel and they're retaining any additional splits. You're thinking you're buying a piece of property that you could then split. Not unless all the land divisions are transferred. So that's what this particular clause is now addressing. Question. I'm selling a you know what, I'm gonna get closer guys so you can hear this question. Okay, I am selling a cottage. The owner of the cottage owns an additional adjoining lot. She and her husband own another lot that is adjoined to the property. They have separate uh, property ID numbers and those two lots are being included in the sale. In my addendum, to the purchase agreement, I indicated that lot and identif identified it by the P, uh, purchase agreement or per, uh, property Pro ID number, number and then identified the owner being Mr. And then the second lot I identified in the same way and identified the owner as Mr. and Mrs. Saying that those two lots are included in the sale of the property located at. Is that sufficient? Survey says, <laughs> yes. You know, we, we always want uh, to be as thorough as possible, a simple identification. If it's a lot number, you know, lot 16 and 17 to be included in the sale. Um, if you have a long or uh, the meets and bounds descriptions, sometimes you just want to see attached addendum with full legal description. If you do something like that, be careful, because now we're talking typos. And I, I had a listing that uh, for over a hundred years, it uh, had the wrong legal description. And it was as simple as Northwesterly, and it was Northeasterly, because it was NW versus NE, NWLY versus NELY. It's all it takes, and you could have a major issue on your hands. So. Um, I think sometimes that might be the property ID is actually the best. And, uh, but yes, as long as it's all on the purchase agreement, we're going to be good. Uh, the, the key here is, is that you have to go back to your pre-licensed training and remember that there's the quote unquote parent parcel on a 40 acres. And then there's a formula that they use to determine how many splits may exist on that 40 acre parent parcel. Well, if they split off 10 acres to sell that to you, well, did you get any of the additional land division transfers? Did you get any splits with it? Needs to be addressed and that's what this is talking about. Stored fuels. This is a one where I, I'm gonna say, if you're out to our more rural properties, is when you need to take a look at this. If it's not on natural gas, then you're dealing with stored fuels. If it's LP or 
uh, fuel oil, you're dealing with stored fuels. I want you to know, on our purchase agreement, it says stored fuel, all stored fuel. So what if the seller takes it down and there's not much more than a gallon the day that you close and get possession? That's what you get. What if they just filled it up? That's what you get. So it, it's really on the seller. The reason that I've put this clause in there as an availability is really to bring it and highlight to a seller that whatever you have left in the tank comes along and is included with the property. So whatever's left, that's what's there, but they have to maintain something in that tank so that if we're in the dead of winter, the house has still got its heat. But anything that's left in there, it does go with the property. So it's just, this is again, it's on our purchase agreement, but we had one where somebody went, well, we'd like a credit for, we just filled the tank which buyer probably would have worked with it, but it was a whole additional issue that caused a problem. It, it spell things out. As I always say, when in doubt, spell it out. Here's one. Acceptance of contingency on sale of home. So this is, we're making an offer. Our home hasn't been sold yet. It may not even be on the market. This is written in such a way that the seller can say yes, but still set, uh, sell the property, market the property, accept another offer, and that deal will go, boom, dead. I'm not a big fan of the 48, 72 hour clause, 24 hour clause, or giving you the, no. Uh, not when I'm representing the seller. So this is written from a perspective of, I represent the seller. I don't want to have the seller effectively take their home off the market because what we know, if you're part of real comp, we have to now market CS or CCS, whichever way it, it may be now, but that's contingent, contingent, continue to show. But all we've got to do is look in the mirror and how many of us will actually show that property. So if we don't do it, then I would think that most others are not going to do it. So effectively, we've taken the home off the market. So I don't like those in, in here. My thought is, you got the money to buy it? Buy it. But I'm not going to give you 72 hours to see if you get lucky and sell it in three days when you couldn't sell it in 30. All right? So that's what this clause is all about. Uh, I'm just going to check... Most buyers don't know how they can. Uh, already got them all. Okay, great. Hey, Darwin. Um, all right, next one. Buyer agency compensation. Mm, this is going to be too deep. I'm going to go past that one. If you understand it. Yeah, that's right. I'm I'm sitting here and I got four guys with me here, guy, and and they're all kind of. Uh, so I'm going to go buy that one, uh, but it does apply to something, but uh, we're not going to worry about it. Contingency of appraisal. Now, we know that essentially an offer that's contingent upon financing is contingent upon the appraisal. But at the same point, if you don't write the purchase agreement correctly, otherwise, if they're going to put $100,000 down on a $200,000 home, does the appraisal really matter? Oh, uh, not at that point, because it's only got appraised for enough for them to get a loan for $100,000, boom, contingency removed. So it's not a straight contingent upon the appraisal. If they're really worried about it, you need to put an appraisal clause in here. And this is just simple. This offers contingent upon the home appraising at or above the purchase price. Because you see, that's what so many people do. They put that first sentence in, and that's it. Okay, so what if it doesn't appraise? Then what? That's the problem that people have when they write clauses and don't use these that we've actually got preset. So now let's read the rest of it. 
in the event the home does not meet or exceed the purchase price and satisfactory terms cannot be negotiated. Otherwise, the buyer and seller talk and the buyer's going, well, look, it's, it's only worth this. And the seller's going, well, I don't care what that guy said it's worth. This is what we want. Then the buyer may, at their sole discretion, terminate this agreement with full return of the earnest money deposit. Ah, that's a great question. So the, the question comes up this way. Isn't that understood? Well, that's what we all think because we're in it on a daily basis. But let's take it to the judge. Why leave anything open for interpretation? So again, when you're writing clauses, you, you've got to ask or answer, what if? We, we have to close this as much as possible so that it's not an assumption, but it's very clear as to what the remedy would be, what will happen in the event. Not standard at all. Not standard at all. I mean, you think of most purchase agreements, it says, this offer is contingent upon the purchaser being able to secure a blank type of mortgage by the way, you're, you're setting up what the contingency really is. Don't leave blanks. Don't allow people to put blanks or leave blanks. They're forcing you to counter because really what's the contingency? Is this a line item that has been added to Century 21 paper? Um, it's a, a, a um, the way I would put it is, is in real comp, Remind docs. So guys, the question is, is this actually part of our paperwork? The answer is no. All of these clauses are not on the paperwork. But it's designed for you to be able to copy, if you will, copy and insert onto the purchase agreement or onto an addendum. So that's that's what these are for. Well, those aren't am I real for. Here, Bob, I'm just, yeah. I got Bob DeBoer with us. Everybody say, hey, Bob. For those on MI Real Source, of course, you all know Transaction Desk also has this opportunity to insert the clause. There's Bob with his radio voice. We all got to have some fun. I like that. Thank you. I, I forgot that they've got Transaction Desk. All right. Contingency on the closing of a home. Now, and by this is a different thing. Uh, I'm okay with sellers accepting these, but I, I want certain things. So this particular one says, this offer is contingent upon the closing of the purchase home located at, on or before this date. In the event the purchase home does not close in the allotted time, this purchase agreement may be declared null and void by either party with all earnest money being returned in full to the purchaser with the seller, the buyer, the broker signing of a mutual release. So that's a really simple one that addresses exactly what can happen. This one, due diligence on vacant land, and I'm going to try to hurry here because I see that we've got a minute left is all. This is when somebody's buying vacant land, and it's to go into a little bit more detail that basically goes, they can walk away for any reason they want. But these are some of the key parts that someone will want to look at. In addition to paragraph 26, this offer is contingent upon but not limited to the due diligence by the purchaser of the following. In a key, but not limited to. Let's go. Earnest money deposit. Guys, I, I believe that the best way for you to be able to do an earnest money deposit if you don't collect it up front is to do it upon acceptance. This is written as per law, and it says, earnest money is addressed in paragraph five shall be received and deposited within five days of receipt of seller's acceptance. Otherwise, we need to be notified that the sellers accepted the offer because now we have a meeting of the minds. It's an accepted agreement. We now will collect. And a lot of people don't put that last part 
they go upon acceptance. Well, if you write an offer and the seller accepts it, you've got to accept an offer. You can't get the earnest money deposit. You're not with the buyer. The reality is we need the time to notify the buyer and say, get us the money. This gives us that little leeway. Now, I will throw out a lot of people will do this upon inspection or the removal of the inspection contingency. I'm not a fan of that. And here's the reason. I've had this happen to one of my agents. We get going, we remove the inspection contingency, and then we go, oh, fill in the blank. I never collected your earnest money because I forgot that I did it on inspection removal. Oops. I want you to picture this. What happens if the buyer removes the inspection contingency? You get the closing or coming up on it and you go, oops, I never got the earnest money deposit. And let's just say the buyer decided they weren't gonna close. Rut row. By the way, it happened. There's a reason I teach you guys the things that I do. There's 35 years of experience, not only of my own, but in working with everybody else. And that's throughout the country that I've been able to capture a lot of this stuff. Be wary. I have it in here. That clause is in there. But I think it's best if you're not going to collect it up front, do it upon acceptance. Can we get a copy of these clauses? Can we get a copy of these clauses? Your manager should have them. I say should. They should all be on real comp and they should all be on transaction desk. So real comp with Remind Docs Plus, clauses, transaction desk, clauses. They should be there. Um, I, Express Docs. If I use Express Docs, are they there? No, <laughs> they're not. But yes, these can be available to you. The managers have all received them. If you check with your manager and they say, you know what, I, I don't know where I put them. I would understand that, I, I manage, and you can't always find everything that you save, and you don't always keep everything you receive. Uh, just have them request, I will send this particular document to them. Lease, if you're doing a lease, there's one thing I gotta give you. A landlord should reserve the right to inspect the property at whatever time interval they want. My suggestion, they should do it quarterly. Hard for a property to go bad and have a, a tenant destroy it, if they're actually there on a quarterly basis. It happens, but it's very difficult. This simply ad addresses how that can work and can be put into a lease to further describe what their right to inspect the property would be. Guys, uh, this might actually be, I don't know if we've done this, a lease with option to buy, uh, purchase, a lease with option to purchase. That's what this is addressing. That might be a, Hot topic on its own to really understand fully how that works. I'm going to hold that one. Seller paid concessions. Let's keep it simple, but be specific. Seller to contribute blank percent of the purchase price to be applied toward purchaser's closing costs, taxes, prepaids, and any other allowable expense because it is up to the lender as to what they'll allow and how much they'll allow. You need to work with them in regards to that. And obviously, if it's a flat dollar amount, just put the dollar amount in here instead. Unusual personal property, be specific with this verbiage. This will get a lot of personal property approved by a lender, but not all of it. You're not gonna get a $20,000 tractor or a side-by-side -side thrown in because you're buying a uh, 80 acre parcel. Um, a piano, a gun safe, a pool table, those are unusual personal property. Use this and you're gonna be all set. Guys, we could talk about backup offers. I'm not gonna go all the way through it, but know that it's in here. You have a backup offer, work with your manager in regards to that. That could be another hot topic all by itself. What I would tell you is most people don't understand what accepting a backup offer is. And ABO is the way it's worded in real comp. But accepting a backup offer you're accepting, signing 
by golly, you better do it the right way because you don't want your seller accepting two purchase agreements. And, and here, I'll hold it as a backup. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's dead. And if it's going to become live, it needs to be done with the right ways. Um, contingency with the uh, shortfall guarantee, earnest money deposit upon inspection. Again, I don't encourage it. The escalation clause with the appraisal guarantee, this is in here. If you guys have not, if you had a condensed version of any escalation clause, this one, right? That one. Yeah, I, I hope we don't have to use these much anymore. There's the escalation without the appraisal guarantee. And I think that is it. Um, guys, I'm a little bit over and I'm going to say it's 1236. I apologize for those six minutes. There will be more stuff that will come. Um, yeah, Paula, if you would, you could even send me a uh, uh, request for that directly. Darwin at darwinconley.com. Make sure it's C-O-N-L-E-Y. We use a simple one. Uh, Darwin at darwinconley.com. I'll send that to you directly. Get with your manager, see if they have it. But uh, yeah, I can give you a copy of this, no problem at all. And of course, my suggestion, use it if you have transaction desk or use it if you have Remind Docs Plus. I think uh, for our Midland agents, th they've got them in there, don't they, in their system, if I remember correct? Okay. So hopefully, I'll put it that way. But Jeremy and Lisa can answer those questions for you. Guys, I'm going to run it from there. I hope you had a fun and informational one. Uh, coming up, we're going to be talking about the uh, first time home buyers savings account. We're going to look toward that. And we're also going to look at some mortgage 201, or excuse me, title 201, uh, as I was looking back over some requests. So look for those to come up in the next couple of weeks. Guys, with that, it's another Hot Topic Tuesday. We'll see you next week.